Uh, greetings uh, to all of you, dear participants. Uh, we welcome you to this webinar entitled uh, The Effect of the Coronavirus Pandemic on Persons with Disabilities. Um, it is a great privilege for UNITAR, the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, to be able to organize uh, such an impressive array of uh, speakers. Uh, you are going to hear more from them. Um, and uh, also to focus on a topic which is very much needed. We uh, think of all vulnerable populations, but particularly with uh, persons with disabilities, as something that governments are, are taking care of. And of course, there are impressive uh, advances as compared to previous decades. But still, if you think of a pandemic like the, the one that we are living now, uh, indeed, they are uh, perhaps more exposed and affected. So without further ado, I would like to simply recognize uh, from the beginning the support of the government of the Republic of Ecuador and its permanent mission to the United Nations in New York and the presence of uh, its uh, permanent representative ambassador, Luis Gallegos, who is also the chairman of the board of trustees of UNITAR. Then we have um, representing the United Nations uh, at the highest level, Ms. Santa Maria Menendez, the UN Secretary General, Senior Advisor of Public Policy, um, at the Secretariat, and another Secretary General uh, that will be speaking on behalf of the organization. Quite an honor to have her. And uh, for the rest of the panelists, I will have the privilege of introducing each one of them um, uh, when the moment comes and as we advance on the agenda. So again, on behalf of UNITAR, the United Nations as a whole, and the government of the Republic of Ecuador, welcome to this webinar. We are going to begin, without further ado, by sharing a, a short presentation on um, what has happened so far uh, from a very general overview. And I am, um, I should have said that from the beginning, my apologies, I am Alex Mejia, your friend, a division director at UNITAR, and also the chief of the UN magazine in Geneva called UN Today. So with that, uh, those introductions, let's get down to it. And um, we'll show you some slides, including this um, initial one, that tells us in, in one image uh, how bad it has been, even though we remain optimistic, even though we are uh, perhaps moving on in some parts of the world, uh, of the world in other areas and in other countries and territories, things are still very raw. Um, there, is, uh, there are 194 member states, uh, but you see there, uh, the United Nations, but you see there 217 countries uh, and territories, because in addition to the member states that we have, there are several sovereign territories that have also been affected. The red circles are, of course, the number of people infected. The green circles are the number of people um, improving or recuperated after uh, being infected with the virus. But the white dots, unfortunately, and we will get to the numbers, are the, the very sad reality that very many people have died. Let's go to the next slide uh, and you'll see how this is more apparent. From 15 March to 27 May, uh, two months and a half, not even, we went from 169 total confirmed cases to 5.6 million and 6,500 uh, deaths to 353,000 deaths. Um, the total recover um, you see in green numbers, but allow me to focus very briefly on the, the names of the countries and the circles that are under. You see that the United States two months plus uh, ago had only 3,700 cases. Now it's almost 1.7 million. But we also want to call your attention to Brazil and Ro Ro Russia that today, or as of yesterday, are the second and the third most infected countries. It's almost 400,000 people in Brazil and 370,000 uh, people infected in Russia with very different capabilities when it comes to their uh, public health systems. No uh, particular comment there, but our colleagues at WHO, the World Health Organization here in Geneva, do monitor these things in trying to provide support, guidance, and uh, the most important emergency relief. And the three countries that you see to the right uh, do have very different capabilities when it comes to dealing with this pandemic, but we will get to that very soon. Next, please. In this slide, 
Um, and we wanted to keep it here because I wanted to reduce the number of slides uh, for this webinar, but it's important to see because you see the exponential growth of the pandemic. It started early in, in March, this uh, accelerated growth, the pandemic, of course, uh, several months before, at the end of last year, perhaps. We will reach 6 million people very soon. And if you look at the graph to the right, you will see that um, the number of cases reported per day continue to grow and aggressively grow. Um, as of yesterday, uh, or the day before, 99,000 uh, cases reported in one day. And this all depends on the number of um, uh, tests that countries are performing and administering. So it could be more. Next, please. In this slide, just to give you a general overview, you'll see um, that the coronavirus is not necessarily in, in the graph to the right in that matrix, it's not necessarily the most aggressive or, or the, with the highest mortality rate. But if you go to the left, you will see that it is indeed very much uh, different from the flu. It is 1.5 to two times um, uh, higher in reproduction. 70% uh, of the cases of the coronavirus are severe, requiring oxygen. And 5% of the cases are actually critical, requiring ventilators and ICUs, intensive care units. The crude mortality is around 4 to 5%, um, while seasonal influenza is well below 0.1%, not even 1%, but 0.1%. Next, please. So here you see um, in these lines how much the United States of America has been affected and our thoughts and prayers are with them. Uh, New York and, and the surrounding area, of course, are on the news uh, constantly. Uh, it seems that uh, things are improving, but the distance between uh, the aggressiveness of the impact in the US as compared to the other countries that perhaps have reached the flat uh, part of the curve um, is astronomical. And um, in this particular case, I will refer to the epidemiological approach uh, that the countries are taking very briefly in the next slides. Next, please. This graph shows you in one image um, how the economy has been gravely affected. And um, we all understand that this started at the end of last year or early this year as a global public health crisis even before it was declared a pandemic by WHO. But we have seen also how this went from the realm of public health to the realm of the social um, uh, behavior uh, in our countries and then to the economic uh, uh, crisis perspective. So it has been a compounded effect. And here you see what has happened in the, the main stock markets in the world, in India, the US, Brazil, Germany, China, Japan, the UK, France, and Russia. Uh, in March and April, uh, as fears of recession drove investors to say heavens, equity markets plunge, and around one third of their values has been lost. Next, please. The International, International Monetary Fund, um, and I am very pleased to, to use these numbers. I'm a former governor to the IMF, um, representing my own country, Ecuador. Um, and I still have uh, very many friends and former colleagues there. Um, they, they tell me that this scenario that I'm going to uh, briefly explain to you is perhaps um, uh, an optimistic one. So it could be even worse than what um, the chief economy of the International Monetary Fund, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jita Gopinath has stated, uh, that perhaps the, the impact will be a decrease of 3.5 to 4% in, to, in real GDP growth year on year. And if you compare that red bar in front of you with the, the small uh, bar to the right, which corresponds to the global financial crisis of 2009, there's really no comparison. Even with all what happened a decade ago, even with all what we remember, uh, the real GDP growth or, or decrease in this case for the year 2009 was 0.1%, not even 1%. Uh, those the great lockdown will result in the worst recession since the great depression itself uh, a century ago or so next please now the recovery the imf uh, assumes that in 2021 uh, hopefully the uh, global economy will rebound to 5.8 percent of gdp growth 
but if you look at the numbers, at the actual numbers, and this is early estimations because this is an ongoing target, it cannot be determined uh, accurately yet, there will be around $9 trillion of output loss in 2020. Uh, a very humongous impact that has very many faces behind it in the millions, because that means unemployment, amongst other things. Next, please. So, uh, in this overview, um, you, you can say, and I'm going to accelerate here, that there are very many lessons learned uh, on the public policy side, but there are several others that I will cover as well. However, because we are the United Nations, we want to call your attention to the left on the need for interagency coordination at the national level and harmonization at the regional and global levels. That should be indeed a priority. More than ever, the objective um, established in Agenda 2030, the Agenda for Sustainable Development, must become the basis and reason for all public policy. And if I may add to what is written there, as a former government official myself, I tell you that I am a great believer on the SDGs. I was a great believer on the MDGs before, and it would be a pity that all what we have achieved and all the progress that we have been achieved under the MDGs are now four or five years under the SDGs will be lost. But that's um, what, uh, unfortunately, we have um, seen as early warnings because governments um, are fully focused and the resources are fully focused financial and beyond on dealing with this pandemic and in protecting uh, people's lives. So the fight against poverty perhaps is going to take a dent. Next, please. In this light, on the response measures and, and, and keeping this visual, visual view of the whole, um, we simply want to uh, postulate that the path uh, to the next normal, to whatever will happen uh, when this pandemic is behind us, indeed has involved already resolve. We have seen it for every member state, resilience, we are seeing it as we speak, the ability to go back to normal or to deal with the impact of the crisis. And then in the return of our economies to a more normal scenario in terms of production and consumption, um, this is still not clear uh, because uh, depending on the country, uh, things are still very fluid. However, moving forward, whatever it is that the post-COVID world will be, will require reimagination and indeed reform. So this is a time, including issues of disabilities, to think of reform uh, the regulatory framework, the legislative um, uh, schemes of every country um, as uh, in need of review. And when it comes to the economic side of it, indeed, um, uh, to foster economic environments because it is much needed. Next, please. Here, you see that um, as resilience become a priority for states, both nationally and locally. Here, I want to introduce that perspective to you. At UNITAR, we do work at the national level as all UN agencies, but particularly at the subnational and local level. We have this uh, training of um, uh, this network of uh, training centers around the world, 21 of them called CIFALS. Uh, one of the founders of uh, CIFAL Atlanta, the one in the US is here, Mr. Axel Leblois, and I welcome Mr. Leblois again. He will understand better than anyone why this dichotomy between uh, public policy implementation at the national level and also at the local level should have harmony and should become a, a virtuous uh, cycle. It is not always the case. And depending where you go, especially in the developing world, in countries like mine, that's where things get complicated because the national government indeed has the ability, the resources, the experience, the knowledge, and the priorities to deal with the pandemic, but the implementation at the local level, even at the community level, could be very different. So the UN has considered that uh, on the economic recovery side of this pandemic, um, we will need at least our Secretary General has postulated in the creation of a new COVID fund, $2.5 trillion to address economic recession caused by COVID-19. And then uh, whatever is, is needed in this recovery should happen also at the local level. That's the message of this slide. Next, please. Here, uh, you see that not only, not only is, of course, um, the economic recovery, social measures um, uh, are very different. Um, as of now, the establishment of uh, new public-private partnerships, and there are examples in this webinar that you're going to hear about, um, they, these PPPs 
uh, hopefully can also help to provide social services or improve them uh, to the most excluded populations. That uh, has already been the case during the pandemic and we expect that is the case again. Next, please. Uh, in this uh, um, uh, description of what is happening and perhaps what is needed ahead, I won't dwell too much into these uh, last two or three slides um, uh, focus particularly on disabilities, but I will mention some things because you do have very many experts in this webinar and I'm not one, but I am an expert on public policy. And I simply want to say that um, inclusion, accessibility and technology uh, should be uh, in a virtual circle as I may, um, leverage at the maximum because they are required um, to deal with these issues. Persons with disabilities must be able to receive timely and accessible information about what steps they will take to minimize the risk of infection. In some countries, uh, there are best practices, but unfortunately not in all of them. They should know what actions are being taken that may affect their living arrangements and uh, the availability, availability of services. Caregivers, uh, medication and other changes critical to their personal planning and preparedness that may directly impact their daily life. And to live with a disability is indeed a challenge, but an opportunity. And as long as we have the legal framework and the public sector um, uh, priorities to provide the environment that people with disabilities, that persons, if I may, that persons with disabilities uh, need, they do thrive. So we will be debating this today. And let, let's go to the next slide um, just to wrap up in this um, uh, initial presentation. We will have very many experts uh, talking on uh, building back better. The recovery steps taken today to building back to a better tomorrow will be fundamental in securing the rights of women and girls and of persons with disabilities as outlined in the United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEO. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the CRPD, and in achieving the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs, as I mentioned. So um, uh, I um, welcome you to this webinar. Um, go to the last slide, perhaps. I don't want to miss it, um, if I may, uh, Marta, no, the next one because we, we will have uh, uh, several experts that will talk on this here. Um, uh, before I conclude, um, there are all these recommendations for the inclusion of persons with disabilities um, in response to the COVID-19 crisis. But the first one, and I'm just going to focus on a couple. The first one seems to be obvious, but is not necessarily obvious in some cases, is to consult persons with disabilities and their representative organizations on how the, the COVID uh, response should happen and how there will be mitigation uh, measures um, uh, to the people, uh, to the persons uh, with disabilities, uh, inclusive of, of course, not only disabilities, but also gender sensitive um, uh, policies and implementation. Um, if you go to the next uh, one that I think is, is the last one, uh, let me just focus on um, number six, which is to ensure social protection measures um, uh, and to provide targeted financial relief and income support for persons with disabilities and their caregivers. They are disproportionately impacted by the crisis and they need our help and they are to become and to remain a priority. So let me stop there. That is a very general overview of how this uh, pandemic has affected us so far and why we are focusing in this webinar on this type of analysis. Um, with this, um, I thank you again on behalf of UNITAR. I'm very happy to say um, that my colleagues at the editorial board of the UN magazine in Geneva, the official magazine is called UN Today, as I mentioned, have graciously accepted uh, to include a, an article or perhaps an interview with uh, our Under Secretary General Menendez here. So we can indeed call the attention um, uh, of uh, member states in general to these realities that we just discussed. Uh, I finish there. And uh, again, on behalf of UNITAR, very many uh, thanks. Uh, let me now go to the next speaker, the chairman of the Board of Trustees of uh, UNITAR, His Excellency Ambassador Luis Gallegos, who is uh, also the Ambassador Extraordinary and Penitentiary and Permanent Representative of the Republic of Ecuador to the United Nations in New York.
It's a pleasure to have you with us, Ambassador Gallegos. You have been a great mentor to us and a great supporter to our organization. Your guidance has been critical in these uh, difficult times, and we are happy to have you at the helm. So uh, the floor is your excellency now. Thank you. Please. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, thank you very much, and congratulations on the presentation. Uh, dear friends, uh, I'm, uh, I think that uh, uh, as, as, I saw the, as I saw the videos of most, we are all we are friends and completees from, from, uh, from a long time back. Uh, I, I, I will ha have a brief statement on the, on the beginning of this, of this webinar on, co on disabilities in COVID-19. Distinguished moderator and panelists, dear friends and colleagues, I hope that you are all well, uh, despite the unprecedented worldwide disruption caused by the current pandemic situation. This is the first international crisis of this dimension. It is the first time we have an international transboundary multilateral crisis, which affects every individual in the world. And it affects every individual in a life and death situation. The profoundity of that statement is that we are all embarked on this solution and we see 193 governments in multilateral organizations trying to, uh, to solve and deal with a virus which they do not comprehend up to now, and who, uh, the hope of having a vaccine in the future. The change in the way we live has meant a, an extraordinary example of resilience and an extraordinary example of failure. It has caused hundreds of thousands of deaths, and therefore it is a moment of reflection, but it is a moment of action. Thank you all for accompanying us today. It is an honor to have co-organized this webinar uh, among, uh, with, with the CIFAL network, with UNITAR, DESA, G3ICT, uh, the University of Tokyo. But very specially, I want to thank Ana Maria Menendez for accompanying us as uh, the UN, UN uh, Secretary General Senior Advisor and the Under Secretary for Disability Inclusive Response. Uh, we are facing a global matter that demands our collective efforts with the overall number of COVID-19 cases reaching more than 5 million worldwide. The health systems all over the world have been put to the test. Most of all, the pandemic has highlighted the vulnerability of certain groups, in particular persons with disabilities who suffer disproportionately from economic hardship and health related issues. Persons with disabilities face a higher risk of contagion when they have public conditions associated with their disability. They are in a situation of poverty or extreme poverty. Their care depends from third persons or they do not have the necessary resources to cope with the crisis, among many other factors. For these reasons, the government of Ecuador has permanently active to respond comprehensively to the specific needs of persons with disabilities. We have taken measures in three lines of action, preventive information and care, and care guidelines, cash transfers, and comprehensive well-being measures in the areas of health, employment, education, and food security. May I add that disability, uh, the disability community and the aging community both participate in the same challenges that I am mentioning here, and both of these in numbers represent 2 billion people in the world. At the multilateral level, we have supported several initiatives. On May 18th, Ecuador led a group of 142 member states at the UN to deliver a statement to welcome the release of the United Nations Secretary General's policy brief on disability inclusive response to COVID-19, as well as UN-related guidance from the World Health Organization and the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights. The statement demands that the COVID-19 response and recovery should be disability inclusive and aimed at protecting the needs and rights of persons with disabilities as envisioned in the Convention of Persons with Disabilities and the 2030 Agenda of Sustainable Development. The statement expresses the fundamental need to ensure the inclusion and access of persons with disabilities to health services on an equal basis with others, including medicine, vaccines, medical equipment, and it highlights the importance of ensuring critical information to help the response recovery phases and the available access formats. As every crisis can, uh, can also become an opportunity, 
I hope that the world will emerge from this pandemic a more equitable and humanistic place. The, and, re, and ready to prove that a health emergency can be translated into enormous support for social issues and the protection and promotion of human rights with special emphasis on persons with disabilities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Excellency, uh, for those uh, opening uh, remarks. Uh, indeed, um, uh, very much on point. Uh, without further ado, I would like to now um, invite uh, Ms. Ana Maria Menendez, the UN Secretary General Senior Advisor on Policy, um, to deliver some remarks on the United Nations Initiative for a Disability Inclusive Response to COVID-19. Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and uh, allow me to, to start by uh, thanking you, uh, UNITAR, and also, of course, uh, my friend Ambassador Gallegos for the opportunity to, to address uh, this, this meeting um, and uh, talk about this very important issue of the impact of uh, COVID-19 on uh, persons with disabilities and on a disability inclusive response. As you know very well, this, is, this issue of inclusion is one of the priorities of the Secretary General, particularly uh, inclusion of persons with disabilities and mainstreaming of disability uh, in the UN system, across the UN system. And as such, he launched last year <clears throat> the uh, um, uh, in disability inclusion strategy. So um, uh, this is really, uh, as I said, one of the most, uh, uh, one of the subjects of priority of the Secretary General. And we know that persons with disabilities face particular and disproportionate risks from COVID-19, whether they are living in developing or developed countries. At the same time, uh, due to stigma or environmental barriers, uh, lack of capacity of systems or laws on policies which are not progressive enough, persons with disabilities in all countries uh, are impacted by the virus and are more likely to be discriminated and excluded from the response and recovery efforts if we do not address these factors now. The Secretary General has outlined in general terms three uh, overall areas of action on COVID-19. The immediate health response, addressing the socioeconomic impact of COVID-19, and finally, the recovery from it. Uh, even uh, in normal circumstances, uh, persons with disabilities uh, face great barriers to, accessibility, to accessing healthcare, and because of the impact of the virus, this has been further uh, uh, worsening. And so uh, we have now a heightened anxiety among persons with disabilities of being uh, discriminated against. People with disabilities are more likely to be poor. And we know that persons with disabilities also will experience greater socioeconomic impact from the situation, particularly women, older persons and children with disabilities. And if the recovery is not inclusive and accessible, it will add more barriers and challenges in the lives of persons with disabilities. So obviously our efforts must strive in the response and recovery to be inclusive and accessible to persons with disabilities. As you know, uh, early in May, on the 6th of May, the Secretary General launched a policy brief on a disability inclusive COVID-19 response. Uh, and thank you very much for, to Ambassador Gallegos for promoting uh, this statement uh, that was really joined by many, many, the majority really of our member states in support of the policy brief. Uh, this is one of the first times that the Secretary General has released a specific brief on persons with disabilities and reflects the importance and breadth of the issue. This is not simply a health crisis, it is having a huge socioeconomic impact. And it's clearly already, and it's clear already that persons with disabilities are among the hardest hit. The policy brief reflects on the COVID, uh, on the impact of COVID-19 and recommends short and longer term action in the health and socioeconomic sectors to ensure that disability inclusion is addressed effectively in the response and recovery to COVID-19. 
Uh, the policy brief takes a unique approach in that it also urges consideration of foundational approaches which should underscore any action, non-discrimination, intersectionality, accessibility, participation of persons with disabilities and their representative organizations, accountability, and data disaggregation. My office is also engaging on a number of actions, uh, strengthening disability mainstream COVID-19 funding, making persons with disabilities visible in high-level communications of the SG and the DSG, strengthening coordinating action through a time-bound working group on persons with disabilities and COVID-19, incorporating uh, COVID-19 uh, in the strategy uh, of uh, disability inclusion uh, for the entities to report. So I, I would like to stress that while COVID-19 poses a challenge to the whole of humanity, and particularly to persons with disability who face additional discrimination and risk, it also provides a unique opportunity to demonstrate concrete uh, collaborative and coordinated action to make the response and recovery more dis, uh, um, disability inclusive. Uh, we really think that uh, the UN system, but also civil society, member states, and the private sector have a critical role to play in order to ensure that the response is inclusive and is accessible of persons or to persons with disability. And I look forward to uh, hearing from what the different actors that, who are going to participate uh, in this panel uh, have to say about it. My office remains committed to the issue of inclusion on persons with disability and uh, also on the issue of the impact of COVID-19 and uh, response and recovery. Thank you again to UNITA and thank you to Ambassador Gallegos and over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Excellency, um, for those words and uh, a very holistic uh, message. Uh, if I may, this is a good moment also to, uh, again, uh, thank you, your office, but also particularly one of your experts, uh, Ms. Akiko Ito. This uh, webinar wouldn't be possible without her support and guidance. So, um, Akiko, if you are listening, also our sincere appreciation on behalf of UNITAR to you. Very good. We are going to continue um, with uh, this impressive array of speakers that we have. And um, next, uh, it is uh, my great privilege to introduce Professor Takashi Sutsu of the University of Tokyo, Comets, who will be talking on uh, international normative frameworks for disability inclusion in emergency settings, building back together, and from a perspective, a perspective that goes from the CRPD all the way to the SDGs and all the synergies in between. So Professor Isutsu, it's my great uh, pleasure to welcome you to this webinar. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Mejia, for your kind introduction, as well as UNITAR's leadership in making this webinar series happen. Today, I'm tasked to give a background for a discussion. I heard there are many participants who are new to the topic of disability inclusion today, so I would like to introduce some basic concepts and key United Nations normative frameworks which might be useful to know in working on disability-inclusive COVID-19 response Next, please. First of all, I would like to start with a question. How much of the world's population live with disabilities? Next slide, please. According to the United Nations system, 15% of the world's population, which is about 1 billion people, live with disabilities. So what we are discussing today is not an issue of small amount of people, but a very important global priority. And yet, persons with, disabilities among, persons with disabilities are among the most marginalized populations in emergency settings and disproportionately affected by crisis. For example, in disasters, their mortality rate is two to four times higher than that of persons without disabilities. Next, please. Some of us might not be familiar with the term persons with disabilities. Before, we used many different terms, but now we use persons with disabilities based on the discussions we had among member states and civil society organizations, including organizations of persons with disabilities in the process of developing the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, CRPD. 
His Excellency Ambassador Gazegos was one of the global leaders who made the convention possible, and it is my great honor to be in this round table with him today. The term represents the diversity of persons with disabilities and respect for difference and acceptance of persons with disabilities as part of human diversity and humanity. The convention states, Persons with disabilities include those who have long-term physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairments, which in interaction with various barriers may hinder their full and effective participation in society. Through this article, the convention has wisely transformed the concept of disability with recognizing that what we need to address is social barriers. We call this concept the social model Long ago, there were times disability was perceived as a medical issue, but the convention is based on a human rights approach and aims at non-discrimination, autonomy, equality, participation, and inclusion in all the human rights, such as right to education, right to health, right to employment, and right to cultural life, among others. Taking a wheelchair users as an example, if there is a stairway without a slope or an elevator, the stairway can be a social barrier which hampers him or her to go upstairs. But if there is a slope or an elevator, there will be no social barrier and there will be no disability. This social model is important to be widely known by all beyond the disability community so that we all can we all can start addressing our environmental, institutional, and attitudinal barriers in various sectors. In addition, the slogan of the convention, nothing about us without us, is a key concept we need to bear in mind. Conventions are very strong tools since they are legally binding among those countries that ratify them. And so far, 181 states parties have ratified the convention. That means promoting inclusion of persons with disabilities is legal, legal obligation in most countries. Article 11 is on situations of risk and humanitarian emergencies. And all states parties are required in the convention to take all necessary measures to ensure the protection and safety of persons with disabilities in situations of risk and humanitarian emergencies. Next, please. Disability inclusive development is set as a global development priority in the 2030 agenda and its sustainable development goals, SDGs, adopted at the United Nations General Assembly by all member states in 2015. As you know, SDGs are global priorities from 2016 to 2030 and it has 17 goals and 169 targets. Next, please. Disability is relevant to all the goals of SDGs. Among them, five goals and seven targets specifically mention disability. For example, goal four on quality education has a target which aims at ensuring equal access to all levels of education and vocational training for persons with disabilities. And another target is on building upon building and upgrading education facilities that are disability sensitive and safe. As to goal eight on decent work, target 8.5 is about full employment and decent work for all women and men, including persons with disabilities. Regarding goal 10 on reduced inequality, empowerment and promotion of the social, economic, and political inclusion of persons with disabilities is included in a target. Goal 11 is about sustainable cities and communities, and there are targets on safe and accessible transport systems and inclusive and accessible public spaces for all people, including persons with disabilities. Lastly, Goal 17, open on partnership has a target on reliable data disaggregated by disability. Next, please. In the area of disaster risk reduction, UN organized the World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction in 2015 and adopted the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, which is a roadmap for how we make our communities safer, inclusive, and more resilient to disasters by 2030. And the concept of inclusive disaster risk reduction and building back better got employed as core principles. Next, please. 
In addition, there are several key tools which could be useful in relation to the inclusive COVID-19 response. For example, the Charter on Inclusion of Persons with Disabilities in Humanitarian Action was endorsed by member states, UN agencies, and numerous human rights networks at the World Humanitarian Summit in 2016. The Charter reaffirmed a determination to make humanitarian action inclusive of persons with disabilities and to take all steps to meet their essential needs and promote the protection, safety, and respect for the dignity of persons with disabilities in situations of risk. The Charter established five actionable commitments, which are non-discrimination, participation, inclusive policy, inclusive response and services, and cooperation and coordination. I'd like to also briefly touch upon the Interagency Standing Committee IAC guidelines on inclusion of persons with disabilities in humanitarian action published last year. There are many key persons in the development process of the guidelines today on this round table, and I would like to thank them for developing this practical and useful gold standard. They are the first um, these are the first humanitarian guidelines developed with and by persons with disabilities and their representative organizations in association with other humanitarian stakeholders. They are designed to promote the implementation of quality humanitarian programs and to establish and increase both the inclusion of persons with disabilities and their meaningful participation in all decisions that concern them. The guidelines recommends a twin track approach that contributes inclusive mainstream program with targeted interventions for persons with disabilities. The guidelines discusses four must do actions, namely promoting meaningful participation, removing barriers, empowering persons with disabilities and desegregating data for monitoring inclusion. The IASC guidelines then provides action-oriented what to do for each sector, such as education sector, livelihood sector, health sector, water sanitation and hygiene sector, among others, for different phases of preparedness, response and recovery. Next slide, next, next slide please. There have been strong foundations for implementation in terms of these global normative frameworks, thanks to very hard work by member states, UN agencies, organizations of persons with disabilities, academia, and others. And now we have the SG policy brief. Now is the time to realize them in the COVID-19 response and the post-COVID world with our concrete and renewed actions and adapting them into local culture, situations, and needs. In the process, it is important to involve new stakeholders within and beyond disability community. And in all sectors, we need to increase options so that different needs, different needs can be met utilizing new technology as well as human touch, including social support. In addition, it is very important to listen to unheard voices. There could be silent majority or very marginalized populations whose needs views or ideas tend to be neglected. For example, we need to strength, strengthen our efforts to include measures to respond to needs of persons with invisible disabilities, including persons with mental health conditions or psychosocial disabilities and persons with intellectual disabilities. There are many persons with mental health conditions or psychosocial disabilities, as well as persons with intellectual disabilities still suffering from grave human rights violations, including being detained in chain in health institutions or other facilities, even there are many other options, and we can change that. Including younger generations who are digital native and have very different views on diversity is also promising. They are the game changers. Last but not least, thanks to efforts by various people, now we have a lot of good practices and lessons learned. We need to have networks of centers of excellences and their con constructive collaboration on collection, analysis, and dissemination of data, good practices, and new ideas. Adding these onto existing efforts might contribute to the inclusive COVID-19 response and the realization of truly inclusive post-COVID world where differences and diversity are valued. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, Professor, uh, for a very um, uh, indeed excellent presentation. We will um, move on on the agenda. 
and allow me now to invite uh, Mr. Axel Leblois, the president of G3ICT. Uh, Mr. Leblois will be uh, talking on promoting accessibility in the digital age uh, towards an inclusive and accessible post-COVID world. Mr. Leblois, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alex, and it's a real pleasure to be here at uh, the Unitar CIFAR uh, workshop. Uh, it reminds me a lot of uh, past beautiful uh, experience with uh, both organizations. Uh, today, I would like to uh, take the perspective of digital accessibility. Uh, the uh, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability uh, that we uh, just heard about from uh, Professor Takashi Isutsu. Uh, has an article, Article 9, that defines the obligation to provide accessibility for persons with disabilities. And the definition of accessibility is accessibility to the built environment, transportation, and ICTs uh, on par. So it means that it's as compulsory today to have uh, an accessible website or accessible electronic document or caption webinar than it is to have a ramp on a building. So with that said, uh, if we can go to the first slide, I would like to take you through the, uh, what happened with the uh, COVID-19 situation. Uh, as you very well know, uh, digital tools are in everybody's life uh, very important, uh, from uh, mobile phones to computers, to websites, to internet resources, to ATMs, to television, to everything that's uh, digital. Uh, in the context of COVID-19 and because of the confinement, uh, we uh, saw uh, an extraordinary increase of the usage of uh, digital tools. And so for instance, uh, we saw uh, internet usage going up by 70% uh, just over the past four months. And uh, just uh, as another measure, there were 5 billion active monthly users worldwide of the, first, of the five most popular messaging apps in 2020. Uh, so this is really like a, a sea change in how people communicate, work, learn, uh, access to resources. And just as an example as well, we are using today the Zoom uh, webinar platform. Well, uh, in... Uh, a few months from December to 2019 to April 2020, the number of uh, peak daily participants uh, went from 10 million to 300 million people just for that one platform. So it tells you that there is a huge surge uh, in using digital tools. And when we interview companies and organizations that actually uh, deal on the other side of the fence with providing services, uh, the majority of them, 80 skippers, and said that the pandemic has raised the importance of digital channels for their business. And 62% said that, yeah, the awareness of uh, the impact of digital accessibility for persons with disabilities is much higher. Um, so what that says is that um, there are uh, really uh, uh, critical uh, imperatives for state parties to the CRPD and uh, in general to provide accessible digital content and services. And so I would like to today to, to go over a few quick uh, snapshot remarks. Next slide, please. So on one hand, uh, we have really like a disconnect or kind of a paradox uh, situation. On the one hand, we have had over the past few years an incredible amount of innovation that provides accessibility features to persons with disabilities in ways that never existed before. So for instance, any of you who have a phone, an iPhone, a smartphone, uh, be it an Android or iPhone, will find on their settings the accessibility menu which uh, caters to the needs of persons with uh, visual impairment, hearing impairment, physical impairment, and then uh, pretty much uh, provides uh, everything that you can need for access to assistive technology that you can connect to the phone. And yet, uh, at the same time, uh, providers of services and contents like websites, uh, people who do 
electronic document is ready, all, all of us and every single organization in the world have been lagging in providing the content uh, and, and services in the format and following standards that allow those features, actually the features to work with them. So on the one hand, you have tremendous uh, uh, innovation from speech recognition to text to speech to all kinds of uh, interfaces. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have a massive amount of digital content and services that are not accessible by those devices. So that's where the tension exists. So uh, in the convention, it's very clear that uh, web accessibility is an absolute priority and a must for state parties. So I wanted to create a little poll among participants today and ask you in your opinion today, from what you can see around the world, what is the percentage of state parties to the CRPD that have a web accessibility policy in place in 2020? And that is again, 14 years after the CRPD was launched and uh, many years after most state parties have ratified the convention. So I will launch the uh, poll. So the answer, uh, as I see it here, is uh, on the pessimistic side, which is uh, something I wanted to show you this morning. In fact, uh, the actual number is 58% of uh, state parties uh, have a policy for web accessibility today. So uh, uh, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to tell you that we see three major trends that can possibly bring uh, a better world post COVID-19. One is we see the CRPD compliance already having a huge impact worldwide. Second of all, we see the role of the private sector to be very positive. And third, I think focus advocacy is working. And I want to make sure that uh, while we recognize the gaps and the problems and the issues, we also see the positive side of the picture, which will be the goal of my presentation today. Next slide. So if we look at uh, what's going on around the world, and I, we like data to make sure that we uh, pursue the right uh, advocacy priorities. Uh, so we, we do monitor our uh, CRPD state parties, and uh, this year we, we have 137 countries where we have panel of persons with disabilities providing feedback to what's going on in their countries. And so what you can see here, between 2018 and 2020, uh, the number of countries, the percentage of countries that had TV accessibility policy went up from 47 to 61%. Uh, web accessibility policy from 43 to 58%. Uh, ebook, uh, accessible ebook uh, policies from 40 to 51%. Public procurement uh, requiring uh, the purchase of accessible goods and services from 31 to 45% and mobile from 30 to 38%. And let me tell you, uh, back in the days when the convention was just launched, those percentages were close to zero. So the CRPD normative framework uh, that uh, Professor Izutsu mentioned earlier this morning has a huge impact nationwide and worldwide on what's going on in terms of uh, uh, policies for digital accessibility. And we need to recognize that. Now, is all those implementation going well? There, I think there is a huge gap that we also measure, but we don't have the time just wanting to go through it, but there are huge gaps in implementation. So let's go to the next slide, please. We see three areas where uh, over the next few years, we can really affect major changes for uh, little investment in advocacy and effort. Uh, first of all, uh, we uh, believe that activist standards should be more widely adopted among state parties. Right now, a majority still don't have any accessibility standards defined for digital accessibility. That's a huge uh, uh, drawback in terms of uh, doing anything effective in the country. Um, there is also uh, a lack of expertise among governments, and 61% uh, of state parties do not have any kind of uh, unit or agency or group of people among their administration 
that is specialized on digital accessibility. And let me tell you, if without that expertise, it's super difficult to roll out any program effectively. And then uh, most importantly, and I, I'm, I'm so very pleased that uh, my colleague Alex uh, mentioned that earlier, the biggest drawback in, we see in most countries is the lack of consultation of persons with disabilities in the drafting, designing, implementation, and evaluation of digital accessibility policies, uh, legislation, and regulation. Everywhere we see good cooperation between the disability movement, government, and the private sector, things tend to work. Uh, everywhere there is no consultation, things are far more difficult. This is one of the features of the model policy report, by the way, that we did with the ITU, uh, which covers mobile, television, uh, computers, and all types of technologies, which uh, is used by quite a few member states. Uh, but I think it's really important to realize that the first order of priority is really to consult persons with disabilities. Next slide, please. Uh, let me talk to you about the private sector a little bit. Uh, there again, we see a very interesting movement. We, we just completed a survey of a bit more than a thousand organizations around the world that are involved in digital accessibility. And what we see here uh, is uh, the details about how long those organizations have been doing, uh, focusing on digital accessibility. And while uh, very few organizations, like 17%, have done, have made efforts in digital accessibility for, the, for more than 10 years. Um, there is a pretty much rapid growth of the number of companies having now a dedicated team to deal with digital accessibility. And this little chart shows like, you know, 11% had, you know, one, one year, 27% two to three years, and 21% four to six years. What that means is that most corporations that are dealing with the public now are starting to realize they better be equipped to deal with it and better serve persons with disabilities. So that's super good news. Next slide, please. And when you see why uh, organizations are looking at uh, promoting digital accessibility, uh, it's really important to realize it's not necessarily because they are worried about litigation, but far more because their values include uh, the goal of being inclusive with people with disabilities. Uh, yet, uh, uh, in quite a few places, of course, uh, there is more protective approach. I want to make sure I'm, not, uh, I'm, I'm compliant with the law and uh, I want my brand worried about litigation. But uh, all in all, uh, the understanding that persons with disabilities should be included in everything is driving the change in the private sector today, both in North America and Europe and the rest of the world. It's not very different from one region to the other. Next slide, please. So with that context, uh, how do we see advocacy uh, for digital accessibility in the post uh, COVID-19 environment? First, uh, we need to continue to foster innovation and competition among IT vendors. I think it has been super effective over the past few years to create competition for accessibility in the marketplace. Uh, the, the, the power of the marketplace dynamics uh, to promote uh, new technologies and new solutions is incredible. And so we saw the competition among Apple, and Google, and Microsoft and others in providing more and more and more and more accessible features to their product embedded in our product free of charge. Yeah, it has been an extraordinary progress. Um, the second area where we need to continue to push is to keep benchmarking state parties and keep keeping uh, reminding state parties and advocacy, local advocacy organization, uh, how do they fare compared to benchmarks, global benchmarks, so that they can see that progress is possible. You know, if a country with this type of GDP per capita or in this region achieves X, the next country in the same condition, if it's far, far behind, has a real case to say, well, we, we could do much better. So that's kind of the uh, real important uh, aspect of having good data on what's going on. Um, the third element which we, we think um, um, is uh, 
regarding the, uh, um, I'm sorry for the deal, there is a listing on the screen here, but um, we need to continue to provide support policy for sectorial uh, areas. So for instance, over the past few years, uh, we have worked uh, extensively with large cities that have smart cities programs in place to make sure that everything they do for smart city services are accessible. Uh, access to justice is a super important domain for digital accessibility, because as you probably all know, the percentage of persons with disabilities among inmates uh, in North America and the rest of the world is disproportionately high. And we don't know if it's a source of uh, uh, bad procedure, people can't have access to uh, due process or not, but it's definitely something we need to, to be very much focused on. The higher education sector is another sector where uh, we have committee of practices among universities who want to ensure equal access to all their students and faculty, and of course in the private sector. But uh, the last thing that we are, we are super happy about is you know, back in 2006, we started uh, preaching in the desert a little bit about digital accessibility. Uh, nowadays, uh, so many more organizations are involved in it. It's beautiful to see it. Uh, one of the things we, we, we started was to promote uh, an accessibility professional organization called the International Association of Taxi Professionals. If we can go to the next slide. So in, in a nutshell, uh, while in the past there was no uh, uh, real organization to help people involved in digital accessibility in the organization, there is now one. Uh, it's growing extremely fast and this is a source of great joy for all advocates because now we have people committed to provide digital accessibility in most uh, important organizations, government, uh, private sector, universities. Uh, Today, there are 2,400 members in IAP in 67 countries. And I think it's going to be uh, a major change agent uh, for the long term because uh, you can really enhance skill sets, uh, knowledge, share good experience. Uh, and I think that's the next horizon for, for us in terms of advocacy for, to promote digital accessibility is to make sure that people know what to do to make it work. So uh, with that, I would like to, to thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope that I gave you a balanced view that is a sharing between uh, the realization there is a huge gap, but also the fact that there is real progress occurring. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Leblois, uh, Axel, our dear friend. Uh, it's impressive uh, to see how G3 ICT has grown throughout the years and the uh, beautiful impact that the organization has. My respect to you and thank you for sharing all this knowledge and experience. Now, uh, going on with the agenda, allow me to introduce uh, now Ms. Avia Akram. Uh, she is the global chair of uh, the Global Youth Council of UNICEF and co-coordinator of the Asia Pacific Women with Disabilities and coordinator of South Asia Disability and Development Initiative project. Uh, Ms. Akram, the floor is yours. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for giving me yeah. the opportunity. I'm really grateful for the UNHR, for Ms. Aiko, Aiko uh, Thank you very much because this is the right time when we see persons with disabilities are facing a lot of discrimination. We have seen like, um, as um, mentioned earlier, 10 to 15 percent of the total population are persons with disability. And 50 percent of them are women and girls with disability. And if we see like more than 80 percent are from the rural areas. And in this uh, pandemic, COVID situation, this is so complicated for women and girls with disabilities to survive. When we talk about the Asia Pacific region, we have witnessed like and talked to many of the women with disabilities to see what kind of challenges they are facing. And they reported back like, it's so difficult for them to like manage their day-to-day -day life because of the lockdown. 
they are not getting the personal assistance services and it's difficult for them to at, even to go to the toilet. One of my colleagues in Pakistan, she was mentioning, like my mom, she was praying, like I die before she die, because nobody is going to assist her in this situation how they are going to manage, eat food, or going to the toilets, or managing their lives. And they are completely vulnerable or invisible because uh, we don't have specific segregated data. How many of them are existing, where they are located, how we can provide them the assistance and um, make them more visible. We have also seen like there is an increased level of the sexual and gender-based violence because uh, the people who are going to you know support them or trying to provide them the basic services like food items or the rations, they are collecting their ID cards, their basic basic information, and when they provide that, they are like witnessing all that kind of challenges and harassments and receiving different kind of calls at their homes. So that's like quite uh, alarming, like how we are going to talk more about these challenges faced by overall persons with disability. And if we talk about more for the women with disabilities who are confined at homes, who are in the local areas. If we just say in the uh, can you go to the next slide? <clears throat> Thank you. In um, in Pakistan, we when we see like it's like a huge number, they were invisible and not getting the basic support. So then we targeted and talked to the main organizations, the uh, service providers who can you know take in account the accessibility format of providing the information. Because we have seen like the information is not inclusive or accessible for the deaf people, for the blind people, and how we can make it more in the sign language, in the video messages, so people can uh, learn how to protect themselves. Because we have seen like uh, the people who are getting the spinal cord injuries, it's so difficult for them to move, you know, to get uh, for the their bed sores or these kind of challenges. They have to send sanitize their wheelchairs, their hands, their personal assistant, everything. So the, in that situation, it's important how we are providing that information in, in an accessible format. And also the existing mechanism of the service providers, how we can make them more inclusive. So we don't need to start like uh, in the previous disasters, like in uh, 2005, there was a huge earthquake in Pakistan and before that it was flood and you know, so we have established the task forces on aging and disability, in which we incorporated the concerns of persons with disabilities to the representation of disabled people organization. And at the same time, the UN organizations were also part of that task force and some international organization who can provide the support. So in that way, we were compiling all the information in one platform or sharing to persons with disabilities, but on the global, on the regional, in all levels, so people can get more information there. So this kind of initiative was very helpful, but we were thinking like it's important to establish these task forces on the regional level to provide the COVID uh, like immediate response and how we can deal with these crises because we have the sustainable development goals references as mentioned earlier, the, sustain, um, uh, the Sendai framework have clear indication how to talk about the rights of person with disability. So in that situation, we can check in the task force. Uh, so you, uh, you Next slide. Okay, so we have been like on the initiative we, which we can take for engaging person with disabilities is about the twin track approach. And one hand, we need to increase the awareness for a person with disabilities, so at least they are well aware what kind of challenges are existing and how we can support that. But at the same time, we need to prepare 
the service providers, the UN, YouTubers, government officials, and policymakers to reduce the challenges faced by persons with disabilities and especially women and girls with disability in the COVID lockdown situation, and how we can give them the basic, basic health, education, and the employment services. Can you go to the next slide, please? We have also identified, there was a, sorry, the slide is not very much visible, but uh, we can share it later in a different format. Um, we have seen like many of the women with disabilities in this situation are facing the trauma and uh, psychosocial problems because of staying back at home. So how we can develop a mechanism of the peer support group. So people with disabilities who are trained, who are somehow overcome the challenge of the COVID response and they manage their lives so we can train them and they can further provide that information to other women or girls with disability to the disabled people organizations because we need a meaningful participation of persons with disabilities at all levels. So if we are making any policies, we are making our strategies, how we can include them. And I agree uh, with actually, like how we can see um, the technology is very important in this situation. That's the only way we can communicate. So we need to equip persons with disability with the latest technology, how to use that. So we can, you know, allocate some of the resources to train them on the technologies and, and to learn this advocacy style virtually. But at the same time, we can engage some of the uh, like uh, state representatives in the discussions, how we can link both. So this is like kind of a twin track approach on one hand, training persons with disabilities, fully equipping them. And on the other hand, we can engage more stakeholders and make their programs more inclusive. Uh, referencing to the CRPD, we have seen like it's very important how we are seeing uh, young persons with disabilities and older people and other women with disabilities who are confined at homes. We can provide them the all the responsibilities, but uh, taking in mind the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, how we can see it and link it with the different organizations. So this is uh, the key where we are seeing. Uh, Uh, can we go to the next slide? Sorry, uh, the internet connection I lost for a while. Yeah, we have organized several uh, consultations with women with disabilities to share their experiences and also recording their stories. Because this is a pandemic, the state and the other organizations are not prepared for it before. So how we can document that, how we can see these women with disabilities as a resource hub, and they can share more experiences. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Yeah. Some of the recommendations which we have compiled with the discussions of all the stakeholders, like establishing partnership with the organizations of women with disabilities, sensitization and the training of service providers on staff on disability rights and how they can you know, take care of them. Guidelines on infection prevention, smires, because we have the eyesight guidelines, we can check that. And then other organizations uh, who are working on this,
Uh, um, dear Ms. Akram, I think we, I think we are losing you uh, because we cannot um, uh, hear you. Perhaps it's the internet connection. Can you hear us? Ms. Akram? Well, uh, she was just about to, to conclude uh, her uh, presentation, quite impressive. Um, we must, must go on and perhaps she can reconnect uh, later on. Um, let me, before we go to the next speaker, let me uh, briefly um, uh, give you um, uh, again this uh, perspective of the whole. We had a, a, an excellent presentation from a representative of academia, the University of Tokyo, then we have a private sector representative um, uh, and uh, from civil society as well with uh, G3ICT on um, uh, technology and disabilities. And now we were listening also from civil society the voice of uh, Ms. Akran on uh, how, uh, from the practical point of view, this is happening at least in her country or her region. But in this trajectory, uh, um, we, we must go on to the specificity of a particular country. And to do that, uh, in coordination with DESA in New York, uh, with the, the Office of the Undersecretary General, we thought that the case of Nepal uh, would be an excellent case. So um, we will have two speakers uh, to cover on that. And uh, if I may, I would like to briefly uh, mention um, uh, about uh, Ms. Jennifer Ivotson. Uh, she is a physical therapist who trained in Geneva and also later received uh, accredit accreditation in Canada. She has been working for Samaritan Sports Canada for 16 years. And uh, she has a lot of experience in Nepal, including uh, living there on several occasions and for several years. Uh, she focused her efforts on ensuring that rehabilitation medicine is at the forefront of humanitarian development and relief work within uh, the organization Samaritan's uh, Purse. So without further ado, I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Jennifer Ewanson to, to the floor. Jennifer, please. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Thank you, dear Alex, for this excellent introduction. And thank you to the team at the United Nations Institute for Training and Research for the outstanding work you've done on this webinar series. Next slide, please. Dear friends, I am deeply honored this afternoon to give you an overview on why the coronavirus pandemic particularly affects persons with disabilities. As a physical therapist, my passion is to reduce barriers for persons with disabilities in order for them to reach their full potential. And in this regard, it has been a pleasure and privilege to listen to the distinguished speakers on this panel this afternoon. Next slide. I would like to express my thanks for how you are speaking up for the rights of those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Your commitment at the level of the United Nations and at the level of governments to develop policies that defend and protect persons with disabilities is deeply appreciated. In February of this year, the humanitarian networks and partnerships met in Geneva, Switzerland, just weeks before the country of Switzerland shut down all schools and non-essential businesses. The purpose of their meeting was to feature the launch of the Interagency Standing Committee's guidelines on inclusion of persons with disabilities in humanitarian action, which guarantee that the rights of persons with disabilities will be respected, protected, and promoted throughout humanitarian preparedness, response, and recovery. During this meeting, COVID-19 was sweeping across the world. And today, in an unprecedented manner, but in a manner that is reminiscent of a humanitarian crisis, we are having to adapt. Next slide. From a professional standpoint, physical therapists, and being one myself, I naturally tend to focus my work on restoring mobility to a person. In recent years, the restoration of mobility has gone further than maintaining movement. It involves the restoring of functioning. When we look at functioning, there are many dimensions of disability and they can affect a wide range of the world's, world's population. We saw this through the presentations that were given earlier. Movement, vision, hearing, cognition, mental health, communication, social relationships can all be affected. 
And of course, combinations of these are possible. We are talking about a diverse group with large range of needs. So why are persons with disabilities particularly affected by COVID-19? Let's back up and look at some examples of disability. Next slide, please. I'll start with movement, and in this case, a particular example of spinal cord injuries. There are two leading causes of death for persons with spinal cord injuries, pneumonia and pressure ulcers. On the one hand, pneumonia affects persons with spinal cord injuries because of their reduced mobility. Typically, our lungs have the ability to inflate, to deflate, and to expectorate because of the muscles involved, our diaphragm and our intercostal muscles. Depending on the level of a person's spinal cord injury, the lungs will only partially inflate at best. Adding into this equation the restriction to a wheelchair and lack of change of position, the person is at risk of developing infection and not being able to properly expectorate or cough, which is necessary to reduce infection. It's a vicious cycle. On the other hand, pressure ulcers are caused by prolonged pressure on points of contact. We typically reposition our bodies every couple of minutes when we feel discomfort if we're sitting in a chair. It's a gift to have this pain and for our bodies to naturally reposition. Because a person affected by a spinal cord injury cannot feel this pain, they do not automatically reposition. And so their skin begins to break down if it's left unattended and that can reach ulceration. The only prevention is movement. A person needs to be trained to do push-ups to relieve their hips of pressure. They need to be trained to transfer to a different position and they need to keep in mind as much as possible that this needs to be done every couple of hours. Finally, moisture contributes to pressure ulcers. Many persons with spinal cord injuries suffer from incontinence. If a person is unable to obtain catheters to counter their incontinence, for example, during lockdown, the risk of pressure ulcer is severe. COVID-19 puts persons with spinal cord injuries at a higher risk to complications on the respiratory system for skin breakdown, just to name two of the main ones. One possible solution amongst many, but an essential one is to enable access to care for urgent services. The government of Canada deemed the following conditions urgent for physical therapy, multiple orthopedic injuries, amputation, acute stages of a neurological disease, um, generalized weakness and functional decline. What I've just described for persons with spinal cord injuries would fall within these because of the functional decline that could happen from not accessing services. I'd like to recognize also that the government of Canada enabled persons to access this essential care and for physical therapy clinics to stay open and hospitals to keep on delivering the services. In Nepal, I know that hospitals such as Green Pastures and Pokhara um, kept on as much as they could treating their patients who were already in hospital and then finding solutions to give them access. My colleague Bikash will be speaking later about what their patient navigation service has been doing to keep on allowing access to services. So considering these as essential needs is giving a way for persons with reduced movement to access the treatment they need. Next slide, please. Vision impairment. These are two um, different sensory impairments that I would like to briefly discuss. Um, Monsieur Axel Leblois did a great um, presentation on digital accessibility, which is absolutely essential. I haven't seen so much of it from my perspective, um, being located in Switzerland, where most of our information is distributed in printed form and has clearly described norms for social distancing. But a person with visual impairment is automatically in a very vulnerable situation. Whenever they leave their home, they're disadvantaged because of trying to access the distance with other people and trying to keep that distance. They're also disadvantaged because they might not know if others are wearing masks or not. And the progression into cues of social distancing to access food stores, for example, would be complex at best. Outside of the internet, without this digital technology, Braille is used, but of course, touch cannot be um, encouraged in the present situation. 
It's interesting that at the peak of the pandemic in Italy, the Italian government used loudspeakers attached to the roofs of vehicles, police vehicles in particular, to indicate that persons should stay at home. It's not the most typical way of, of um, encouraging auditory transmitted information, but it could be a situation, it could be a solution that could be further developed. If you could just switch on to me as a speaker for a moment and off the slides. Today I chose to speak to you from my home, from a protected environment with my mouth and nose uncovered. This is more comfortable for me, obviously. When I cover my mouth with a mask, as required to do, my voice is immediately affected. In addition, I cannot communicate emotion. You cannot see me smile or possibly frown or encourage you through any of the emotions that you would usually see on my face. Moreover, if you had trouble hearing me earlier, you have even more trouble possibly now that you cannot read my lips. Persons with hearing loss compensate by hearing aids or by lip reading. And if you would please go to the next slide. I would like to uh, just take this opportunity to promote some solutions that have been found, and namely this one uh, that was used, uh, that's being used at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, where Mr. James Wiggins, featured here on the photo, has made transparent face masks available at all levels of the institution so that patients receiving treatment and who are disadvantaged with hearing could read his lips, but they can also witness his smile and his interaction. And depending on um, the way the disability might affect a person, this is a great advantage. Next slide, please. So we discussed how each person is unique and likewise persons with disabilities form an extremely diverse group. For a child who, or an adult, who may be affected by Down syndrome, in some cases, what they might need most is a secure area to experience touch with a defined group of people, such as their family, or a close group of friends, and this in order not to be left behind. Mr. Hubert H. Humphreys, who was the Vice President of the United States and a founder of the Peace Corps, once said, and this is my paraphrase, the ultimate moral test of any government is the way it treats three groups of its citizens, children, persons with disabilities, and elderly persons. Next slide, please. In order to protect persons with disabilities in this current situation, the following essential steps need to be taken. We need to enable access to essential care. That means medical care, of course, but it also means being able to access life-saving supplies such as catheters and the example of persons with spinal cord injuries. It means also being able to access rehabilitation therapy, be it physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy. We need to promote adapted protection measures such as transparent masks, audio transmitted information, or large print and then consider exceptional situations. Children or adults with cognitive disabilities may need safe groups or social networks where they can receive support. And finally, let's all advocate for the rights of persons with disabilities, both during COVID-19 and thereafter. I look forward to working together to meet this challenge. Thank you. Uh, thanks to you, Jenny. Uh, a beautiful and very practical presentation indeed. And I will remember uh, this alternative uh, for face masks. Uh, excellent. Um, and let me now um, uh, continue with the agenda and invite our next speaker. Um, as I say, we wanted to make this webinar rather practical also. And in that sense, uh, Mr. Vikash Adhikari is going to help us to give us a very unique perspective from Nepal. He is the executive director of an NGO in that country called Sundar Doka Sati Sewa, that if you translate this actually a very beautiful name, is Beautiful Gate Friend Services. Uh, this organization focuses on assisting persons, persons affected with disabilities, of course, but also other marginalized and uh, impoverished people um, in, in Nepal. 
they have a unique uh, model of patient uh, navigation and a lot of experience in the challenges faced by the Nepalese due to the extreme conditions of the Himalayas uh, first. You will hear how difficult it is to actually go to a hospital if you live in the mountains. Uh, and then, of course, um, if you remember the poverty levels in that country, uh, it's a compounded effect. So without further ado, allow me to give the floor to Mr. Adhikari. Uh, we welcome you, Vikash. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Moderator and the United Nations Institute for training and re research to giving me opportunities to talk on the behalf of Nepal and give some of the practical. Um, uh, the before panelists has talked so much about theoretical things and, and the policy level, but I'm gonna bring the uh, practical stuff and how the people with disabilities and marginalized people are facing the problem right now in this situation in Nepal. So Nepal is a small country, sandwiched between India and China but the uh, out of 10, eight largest mountains lies in Nepal. Uh, Nepal has got uh, more, than, uh, uh, more than 126 different castes, I've spoken 123 different languages. And as per the census of Nepal, uh, there are around 2% only people with disabilities, but the organization like us who are working for people with disabilities and living with disabilities, and we based on the W, actual report on disability, there should be around 10 to 15 percent. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Next slide. Thank you. Sundar Doka uh, Sati Sewa is a non-profit organization. It was started by the community of people with disabilities. And while working and caring for each other, they realized that they can reach out to the more people with disabilities and the marginalized people. Thus, the Sunadoka Satiseva was born. Uh, the, the founding member, the founding president himself is a paraplegic and he is a wheelchair user. So we do understand what are the problem the people with disabilities are facing in terms of getting medical treatment, access to healthcare, also the different things. So that's why we started a program called a patient navigation. It's an individualized assistance to each and individual patient and their caregiver to overcome healthcare barriers and facilitate timely access in the, complete, in the complex health system right now in Nepal. So in this matter, we do a holistic approach, not only medical, but we look onto their emotional and psychosocial support too. So Sunodoka Satisero is right now is also playing a vital role in responding people uh, with disabilities need in this COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. So COVID-19 is not just only the health pandemic. It is also the socioeconomic and cultural pandemic. The people with disabilities, elderly, women, girls, the families living with disabilities, migrant, informal sector workers, everyone has been marginalized before the pandemic due to the structural and the gender inequalities and the barriers. So persons with disabilities are most vulnerable groups right now. They do often have underlying health conditions which make them more vulnerable to get infected by COVID-19. So if you look, the lockdown in Nepal started from 24th March, but they were only given a two days time. So because of that, people with disabilities were not able to gather the, 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 the needed items, the support for them. The people, uh, the families living with disabilities were not able to support or gather the, uh, the necessary items to support people with disabilities within two times. And also the Nepal government has brought a wonder policy in supporting the whole community and their blanket approach to address the needs or the requirements of people with disabilities in this crisis has been ignorant because they, you have to go to the certain office to ask for the need. And whether you have to care for people with disabilities or you have to go to ask for the need. So because of that, people with disabilities are facing a huge problem in Nepal. So we came with the solution. So, so our patient navigation work has been changed. We are not able to function as before receiving patients from villages and navigate them to the health system. But we changed the way of we doing patient navigation is being the moderator through like a telemedicines to be a moderator between the, the patients in the villages 
and the healthcare providers in the, uh, in the field. So, so we have so far supported 74 children with heart defects uh, uh, and the rehabilitation children needing the support. We've been asking them what are the problems they are facing. We are talking with the healthcare providers, surgeons, doctors, and navigating them. And if the medicines are not available, uh, we are working through the local government to make sure that they are getting the medicines. Information, educational, and communication materials focusing people with disabilities has been designed. Many people are not aware about the COVID-19 and its impact. So also during that time, we found that the first thing uh, we've been requested is a food hamper bag. Many people with disabilities and the families living with disabilities had a food shortage. They were not able to gather. And as well as the many people with disabilities who have a, like a spinal cord injury and their, their medical support like a catheter, uh, urine bag, they were not able to gather well. So we supported around 600 families living with disabilities with food, backer, food hamper bag and also medical and medicine support. And we found that 50% of the people who need support were the physical. And intellectuals were 20%, multiple disabilities were 12%, hearing 10%, vision 5%. And also what we found on the reality is that the many children with autism and intellectual disabilities who love to come outside to play around, to go and run, they were locked down inside the home. They were tied down. They, like one family was tying the rope on the child's hand so that he can run away. So, so the proper information has been lagging. So Sundar Doka Satishiva has been raising awareness and doing proper orientations of COVID-19, whoever we can, through the social media, through the print media, and through the home visit. So <clears throat> let me share you a story uh, about a boy, Ram. Ram is a spinal cord injury. He used to work in the handicraft, making handicrafts and sells it. He was living independently. He had a three-wheeler scooter, so he roams around Kathmandu very freely. Suddenly, the lockdown happens. He was, he was locked inside his room. He was not able to come outside. He was panicking. He was not able to arrange his food properly. So what of the food he has, he has been eating. And, and suddenly, one day, a few days ago, he um, caught with the seasonal coughing. And he called the healthcare centers. He called the hospitals, and they told not to come to the hospitals. And he was panicking. He doesn't know what to do. So he approached us and we took him to the, uh, the doctors. Doctor checked him, did a few investigations, found that he had started getting a psychosocial problem. So only the doctor that advised him is a counseling and plus sleep aiding medicine. He's doing fine right now. He's doing very much good right now. We are supporting with him medical supplies and also the food supply. So, so these are the, some of the challenges that the people with disability. So then my first point uh, on the challenges faced by persons with disabilities during COVID-19 is lack of accessible and a complete information. Next slide, please. So in the beginning, even if you see the Ministry of Health started giving information out about COVID-19, but most of this information does not have a sign language interpreter. Or, or the visually accessible. After the, I was able to come home after 10 days after the lockdown at my home. My father himself is a spinal cord injury. I grown up with the families living with disabilities and my, my fathers and my friends who have a, some kind of disability. So as soon as I came home, my father was panicking because he doesn't have a proper information. He doesn't know what's do's and don'ts, how to take care of him, how to sanitize him, how he clean his wheelchair how to get support, his medicines were going down. So he don't know whether he should go outside to get medicines or ask someone to go to the medicine. So there was a lack of information. So he was panicking. And so there are, there are many uh, COVID-19 uh, messages has been conveyed through FM radio and television, but it lack of accessible formats and inclusive perspectives. Can you go up uh, my slides earlier slide, please? No, below one. And the second point is a lack of access of medical supplies and medical center. As you know, the lockdown in Nepal means the full lockdown. Only the hospitals are looking after the emergency cases. So the outpatient department, the rehabilitation treatment, uh, the source, uh, everything 
is closed right now. I was talking with my friend, um, the earlier colleague, uh, Jenny, that, that when she had a, a problem, she was able to go to the physiotherapist at the Geneva in Switzerland. But all the physiotherapies and occupational therapies in Kathmandu is closed. So there is no access for the regular therapy right now. The hospitals are not open regularly for the OPD. So people with disabilities who need a regular blood checkup investigations, they are facing a problem. Another point is lack of personal attendance and an individual support system. So many people with disabilities, uh, uh, the children with Down syndrome, children with autism, the children with intellectual disabilities, the spinal cord injury, they need a personal attendance. And now we are calling a social distance. So how to maintain a, maintain a social distance getting them? Like if there is only a husband and a wife and one of them has got a, a spinal cord injury, like is that person need to go outside to get food? How to get that food? Or, or should I leave or not? So that is very confused. So there is a lack of personal attendance and individuals that need support has not been met. My, my another point is lack of psychosocial support and increasing rate of violence. You can see, so even in this, uh, during this lockdown, till now there has been a 336 cases of violence against women and girls are documented in Nepal. 48 rape cases have been registered, including one rape of 10 years girls with disabilities in Nepal. So the girls and women with disabilities are most vulnerable right now in the situation in Nepal. My other point is the lack of accessible and gender specific quarantine. I was able to visit the few quarantine facilities uh, in the few municipalities within Kathmandu Valley. And let me tell you, it is not disabled friendly. The infrastructure are not disabled friendly. The, the bathrooms were not disabled friendly. And so if some people with disabilities need to be quarantined, there is no facilities. So we have been advocating for them. And also another reason, uh, the non-residential non -residential Nepali organization are saying that there are around 1.5 to 2.1 uh, million Nepali people has shown an interest to come back to Nepal. So if we're gonna bring all those, we have not any quarantine made right now. My another point is lack of participation and consultation with persons with disabilities. I have not seen when the government are making policy. I have not seen the when government are choosing a people, uh, uh, constructing the quarantine or, or, or going for a case investigations and a, and a case tracing. They have not talked with persons with disabilities. Until now, there are more than almost about 1,000 people has been contacted with COVID-19. None of the person with disabilities has got till now. The questions we have raised is whether they have done any testing for person with disabilities or not. So we feel even the testing for people with disabilities has been missed out during these situations. So, so there are some recommendations or suggestions even for us, for our organization, even for Nepal side is how we are gonna solve this problem. So here are the, some of the a recommendation we have done. We are planning and we are asking government to start a disabled friendly hotline so that the, whether it is the, uh, through the video for the sign language interpreter or, or, or through the phone call, we need a proper guideline and a facility so that we can navigate person with disabilities and their families to get a proper treatment on the right time. So, so we are committed for that. And, and, and I think patient navigation is something every country and every hospital should do it. There is also awareness. We need, to, uh, we need to make awareness about the infection, infection mitigation tips to the person with disabilities and their families. We also need to do a uh, facilitation and orientation for uh, disabled friendly case management contract tracing for, for any government services, we have to do that. And also, also we have to follow up. The organizing lock, like us, the disabled people organization, we need to follow with the government and the municipalities to make the gender and disabled friendly infrastructure and management on the quarantine. And also, we have found that uh, in, the, in the remote places of Nepal, that the technical orientation of COVID-19, responding of people with disabilities to community health workers has been lacking. And there is some, there is a gap 
And also the next point that uh, our, uh, the former panelist has also shared that people with disabilities should not be left out while we are thinking about economic, uh, uh, economic rescue and economic recover. We need to make a program and a project in a such a way that people with disabilities are also able to be a part of this sustainable livelihood economic recovery over. And there is so much need. People with disabilities, one organization, one nation cannot do it. So we have to develop a local, national, international partnership and consortium on responding to the individual needs of people with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you. I thank God and I thank you for these opportunities to make the voice from Nepal. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anikari. Um, indeed, um, you have given us a very uh, impressive and uh, holistic, if I may say, overview of what is happening in your country. And the case of Nepal will remain important, as I said before. We will Thank move you. now uh, to our next speaker, Mr. Gopal Mitra. He's a senior social affairs uh, officer uh, uh, at the executive office of the Secretary General. Um, uh, at the United Nations Secretary in New York. He is going to uh, brief us on the uh, Secretary General's policy brief um, entitled Taking Action on the Recommendations, Inclusion of the Rights, Well-Being and Perspective of Persons with Disabilities in the COVID-19 Response, Recovery and Building Back Better. Now the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it has been such a rich discussion and uh, as uh, has been mentioned uh, uh, by speaker after speaker, uh, we know it is clear that people with disabilities face disproportionate risk and are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. As USG Menendez mentioned, the Secretary General for the first time issued a policy brief on disability. And because we are in the midst of COVID-19, the brief is on persons with disabilities and COVID-19 and titled a disability inclusive response to COVID-19. Uh, the policy brief as USG Menendez mentioned outlines first of all the, the disproportionate impact that it is having on persons with disabilities both on the health the socioeconomic aspects as well as in doing so it also outlines key recommendations. So I would, first of all, I'll, I, I will just speak for five minutes. So it's not possible uh, to get into all the recommendations in depth. I will give you a flavor. Uh, and it has, uh, many of, of the issues have been discussed by the speakers in the panel today. And uh, USG Menendez also highlighted um, some of the overarching issues that the policy brief addresses. Uh, in terms of, uh, of the recommendations, um, I would uh, urge everyone to first of all, read the policy brief. It's a very rich document <clears throat> and um, it, it, it backs up all the issues with evidence uh, uh, where it is coming from, why it is being said. It is available in all the national, uh, in all the UN languages and uh, uh, moving forward, uh, there is some uh, suggestion to have it also translated into other languages. Now coming to the recommendations, um, it, it has four overarching uh, uh, foundational recommendations. Number one, which has been discussed, I think, by UH Menendez, outlined it, and uh, 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 our uh, professor from Japan also outlined the, the, high, the importance of having a twin track approach, which is a key approach for disability mainstreaming. Now, what do I mean by that, and what the policy brief uh, 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 highlights on that? So, let's take, for example, the socioeconomic impact. Uh, persons with disabilities, we know, had very less access to social protection. And the data shows that it's as less as less than 1% in the developing world. Now, when we are talking about, about social protection, mainstream social protection measures or programs, schemes, have to include persons with disabilities. There are already many of them which are already there, existing. They need to be uh, to further reach out to people with disabilities, the social protection, the mainstream social protection schemes programs have to reach out. And in addition, because of the disproportionate impact, there has to be targeted social protection measures uh, specifically for persons with disabilities. It can come in forms of cash transfers, 
top up grants the police brief highlights several of them coming to the aspect of health mainstream public health information MSA, is 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 uh, is being uh, uh, rolled out in an uh, in an at an enormous rate now the mainstream public health information has to be accessible and in addition there are there has to be targeted interventions for persons with disabilities for example we know about the importance of accessibility of information as well as of facilities but what about reaching that facilities for a person with disabilities who is who is, who, who is on a wheelchair that person would need perhaps in some situations transport assistance so these type of targeted measures have to be uh, coupled with mainstream measures. Uh, in terms of, uh, there is one important aspect. Uh, uh, I, I did not hear it in the, uh, I mean, maybe there was an indirect uh, mention of it. We all know that COVID-19, one of the places that gets hit hardest is institutions, nursing home, care homes, and we know people with disabilities, and there is evidence in the policy brief that people with disabilities make up a large part of the institutionalized population of the world. The fatality rate at, is as high as 72% in some of these cases. So the policy brief recommends about prioritizing testing in institutions where a lot of persons with disabilities live, prioritizing provisioning of protective, personal protective equipment in institutions, and coming to the long-term aspects, the recovery aspects, deinstitutionalization is a huge priority for the disability inclusion sector. So when we are talking about recovery, we need to talk, we need to see that the investments are done to build, strengthen community-based services. So uh, uh, while uh, at this point of time, when we're talking about the immediate response, uh, it is important to, to, to address the specific issues in institutions when we are talking about recovery, when we are talking about, uh, about uh, strengthening our systems, we need to invest more in community-based services so that we can, that also will contribute uh, to deinstitutionalization moving forward. This is how uh, uh, the policy brief uh, argues and stresses that how COVID-19 can also be an opportunity. When we are talking about strengthening our health system, strengthening infrastructure, so that if a pandemic like that breaks out again, uh, people with disabilities are not this much impacted or we can minimize the impact. It talks about, uh, uh, about accessibility. We know the evidence suggests that if we plan for accessibility from the design stage is more often than not, it does not cost anything extra or at the most it costs maybe 1% more if we factor in accessibility from the planning and design stage. Now, that is something uh, which, is, which is extremely important. Um, um, speakers before uh, have alluded to the, to the risk, the disproportionate impact and risk and impact that persons with disabilities who are in humanitarian, living in humanitarian situations experience. It is, it is, it is absolutely uh, 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 terrible. Uh, uh, the impact is much more, the, the, the opportunity to mitigate that impact is less. In a densely crowded ID, IDP camp or a, or a refugee camp, the, the very concept of social distancing, protecting, uh, 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 adhering to personal hygiene is a challenge for everyone. And we know it is a bigger challenge for persons with disabilities. So again, there has to be targeted measures uh, to, to address these situations. Now, what we have now is a host of tools that can help us to do that. The policy brief is in addition to that. I know that WHO has uh, taken out specific practical guidance on, on health, uh, on how to uh, 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 mitigate uh, the, the health uh, impact, how to act against, uh, to uh, minimize risk and protect persons with disabilities. For example, the International Labor Organization has taken out, uh, has practical guidance on how to, uh, how to address uh, uh, inclusion of persons with disabilities in the socioeconomic impact and recovery. Office of the High Commission of Human Rights uh, has practical guidance. And I know that the interagency standing committee uh, guidelines, which uh, uh, were also alluded to, has specific, more concrete, in-depth uh, recommendations. Now, uh, advocacy is, is 
a huge requirement. But in addition to advocacy, we have to have now provide or 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 act upon these concrete um, uh, solutions which are there. And to do that, I think it is as has been already mentioned at and the and the policy brief very very strongly highlights the meaningful engagement. It's not tokenistic engagement will not help us anymore. The meaningful engagement with persons with disabilities and organizations of persons with disabilities. Because it is a smart thing to do. It's not only the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. The persons with disabilities have been uh, uh, negotiating these barriers. Many of many barriers uh, which persons with disabilities face have been uh, discussed, have been negotiating these barriers in normal situations. And they have they find creative ideas, solutions of how to address these barriers. And it would be a loss if, if this knowledge and resource is not taken into account um, when we design, uh, when we are implementing our response and design the recovery. Uh, uh, many solutions that persons with disabilities have been highlighting, that telecommuting, working from home, flexible work arrangements, is what we see now being implemented. So there is a huge amount of knowledge and resource within the organizations of persons with disabilities, within persons with disabilities, that can be tapped not only to make the response and recovery inclusive of persons with disabilities, but also to improve the quality of the response and recovery. So the policy brief highlights uh, a lot of these points with solid argument and evidence. And, and uh, I would really encourage uh, um, the participants to read the policy brief. It is available. Uh, if you just Google Secretary General's policy brief, it will come up as the first hit on COVID-19 and persons with disabilities. And, and lastly, before concluding, it's important to have partnerships. Uh, the Secretary General has already highlighted that it's a, it's a human crisis and solidarity and cooperation is, is something which can help us to tide over this crisis uh, and minimizing the impact. So member states, UN system, organizations of persons with disabilities, civil society, we have to act in solidarity, in cooperation, and in partnership. I know there are several, uh, USG Menendez had mentioned several, several uh, initiatives that are there. I think there's a whole lot of information, resources, and tools. And I think it is important uh, to have a place where, where these tools can be hosted also, so that the wider community can access uh, uh, it in one place and, and make use of it. So I will end there and uh, thank you so much to UNITAR and uh, to Ambassador Gallegos, uh, who happens to be a, 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 a close ally in this, in this uh, uh, journey, and uh, uh, to all colleagues uh, uh, for participating and giving me the opportunity to speak briefly. Thank you and over to you. Uh, thanks to you, Mr. Mitra. Uh, very right uh, uh, and very on point uh, to call our attention to the SG policy brief. And uh, indeed, uh, thank you for inviting people to actually go and read it because there are very, very uh, much practical information and very specific uh, uh, also advices and best practices share. So um, these uh, take us uh, almost to the end. We have exactly two minutes. Uh, it's 3.58 in Geneva. And uh, we won't be able to open the floor, but it's okay because I, I, I will have the privilege of reading uh, some of the questions and answers that will normally we will invite people to actually uh, share them. But it's quite impressive. Um, just choosing some, Miss um, uh, Giotti Chapai says that build back better, okay, but build better before is even better <laughs> indeed. So uh, uh, that summarizes a lot, build better before makes sense. Uh, now we have uh, Mr. Francis Albert Mendoza uh, writing, how do we increase the funding for the hiring of teachers for persons with disability? So we can indeed achieve SDG 4, focusing on inclusive education. Very much uh, in agreement. Then uh, uh, Mr. Mendoza um, uh, also says that access to digital devices by uh, persons with disabilities have increased significantly and we should know that free accessibility software is built more and more in these devices. Yes, in reaction to what Mr. Lebla was correctly pointing out. And then uh, we have uh, Ms. Uh, Wasi Sapong, Mr. 
um, that says, uh, and I will conclude here, this webinar is very timely. As a young person leading a youth-led organization in Ghana, in Africa, Utili Foundation is the name, we engage with young people with disabilities as part of our civil care, civic care engagement. Young people with disabilities in developing countries are the most affected during this crisis, and I couldn't agree more. So there you have a, a, a glimpse of uh, several of the um, uh, comments that some of the participants have given us. Uh, but because we're running out of time and we should not go beyond two hours, which is right now, I simply wanted to uh, um, uh, tell you again, under the patronage uh, of Ambassador Luis Gallegos, the chairman of the World of Trustees of UNITAR, the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, and in close coordination with uh, several United Nations entities, and particularly with, with DESA and the team uh, of the Undersecretary General, um, uh, our colleague Akiko Ito, um, we uh, thank you profusely for enduring with us these two hours. Indeed, a beautiful um, overview from the general to the specific, including one member state case, that should uh, be also a call to action. There is a lot to do, and all of us can indeed make a difference. So we invite you to continue uh, following us uh, through these webinars or to connect directly with all the organizations that have participated uh, all of them are close allies of UNITA and the United Nations. With that, I wish you well, uh, all the blessings, and thank you for participating today. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.